keep proving my point. Yes. <laughs> I would like to thank whoever left their half-drunk bottle of water up here uh, in your attempt to give me whatever syphilis of the mouth you have. It's not working. Alright, I'll try this without my glasses on. Uh, 17. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, we're getting started a little early here, because I want to, uh, and y'all were looking so dreadfully bored. <laughs> I felt like I had to do or say something. Uh, so, hi, my name is Eric Vale. Like it says here, in English and another language, which I'm going to assume is Japanese, but... Uh, it might not be. I don't know. It could be hieroglyphics as far as I know. I'm not a very smart person. I'm just an actor. So uh, I'm assuming that's why y'all are here, to hear all of the wisdom that I've acquired over the years, disseminate that out to you. This is the Way Things Are panel, right? right. So the whole concept behind this panel is that I... Uh, I have to answer all of your questions truthfully, no matter what the question is. That being said, I'm not going to truthfully answer what my social security number is, or my home address, or children's birthdays, none of that stuff. But I, I think y'all kind of get the idea. Um, so, uh, we'll see, I'll start off with a couple of things. Uh, a, I am not feeling 100% today, I, I'm a little wonky, I've had a migraine for about four days, and uh, so my stomach tends to do this, so does my head. So I'm getting a little wonky and I just sort of cut and run, uh, I apologize. Right now I'm feeling okay. So, we'll just truck on until I cut it or it's time, whichever happens first. So yes, my name is Eric Bale. I'm a voice actor. I play uh, characters such as Trunks, Direct Ball Z, in America, Canada, and Italia, and others. Sanji, One Piece, and uh, I can't believe Full Metal and uh, Yuki and Fruits Baskets and other stuff. Okay, thanks. So there's a lot of other characters I won't go into. Now, uh, the other thing I would like to say at the top of this, which is just a QA and a panel, really, is uh, we were all taught growing up that there are no stupid questions. There are absolutely stupid questions. <laughs> Some of you might ask them, and if you do, I reserve the right to point at you and go, that's a stupid question. <laughs> so be prepared, and keep in mind, we are here for fun. This is all in fun. No hurt feelings in this room, except for mine. But again, it's my panel, so I can have hurt feelings. All right, uh, so y'all just want to go Q&A from your seats? Sure. Yeah, why not? It's a small living room. All right, go. Okay, whoever is the loudest, that's what I'm going to hear. So everyone ask their questions at once, and I will hear the loudest question. See, y'all aren't doing it. No, see, now look at this guy. He's like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, I'll do that thing. What do you remember from working on Desert What do I remember from working on Desert Hunt? It's an interesting question because we work so fast uh, in anime, you don't really retain a whole lot. Uh, Desert Punk was interesting because I was the head writer for the show, and then I got cast to play Desert Punk. So I was writing the show. And for the most part, knowing who was cast in it, me. And it was easy to write for me, because I knew what my pacing was. Uh, it was great because we got to improvise for that show, because being that it's a uh, comedy, and a lot of uh, Japanese jokes do not translate into English very well. That when they come through a translator, they end up getting flip-flopped around sometimes, but more often than not, the punchline comes first before the joke. So you got to figure out a way to make things funny. And uh, sometimes that was with the original intent of the Japanese. Sometimes you had to get really far away from it in order to sell the humor. 
So it was a lot of fun. I worked with good people, and, uh, Jerry Hanman and Zach Bolton and uh, Peter Hawkinson. We had a great time. A lot of improv, a lot of fun. A lot of boob jokes. We had to, we had to learn uh, a whole bunch of different words for boobs. So we had to look up. I think we found 2,000. I didn't know there, there were that many. Wow. Yeah, we invented a few as well, yeah. Which I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Um, okay, so uh, we've learned today so far that screaming your questions aloud really doesn't work. So we will go hands. All right, so if you if you have a question, you just raise your hand and, and, I'll, and I'll say, uh, here's a good example. Yes? The question I have is, when they do the voice anime, um, are you watching the anime? Yeah, I am, I am. So when we voice in anime, uh, depending on where you go, uh, things are run differently. Most studios are run digitally from top to bottom now. That includes a digital script. <laughs> uh, that includes digital script on one screen, usually to the left, and to the right is the screen with the video on it. So your job as an actor is to, you have to sort of flash, memorize the pieces or piece of dialogue that you're about to say, and then you get to watch the animation once in the Japanese, and then you record it in English. So flash memorize here while you're watching it in Japanese, then you watch it in English, which is oftentimes there's nothing there, no audio. And then your job is to make this sound normal over here. That's it. It's a really, 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 really tedious job. But uh, it, it, it requires a degree of focus that, as an actor, can help you focus in other areas of acting better, in my opinion. Uh, okay, who else? Uh huh. No, no. There's no voice acting gig. No, there's no voice acting gig. I regret that. Uh, I, I I'm an actor by trade. That is my job. I act wherever anyone hires me. That's the only way as an actor you can make a living. Nobody in the history of the world has made a living as an anime voice actor only. You can do it, but you have to supplement it with other jobs. So I do a tremendous amount of other jobs. I do all the commercials for, all the TV and radio commercials for David Busters. So you hear me on there all the time. And uh, also for the Dallas Stars, the hockey team. Cool. I uh, do all their TV and radio, and also all the in-game videos. So if you're watching if you're watching Dallas Stars hockey game, it's a home game, they're gonna play one of those videos that talk about the players or the charities or whatever they're doing, that's my voice narrating it. And uh, they play those games in arena in Dallas as well. And then also on the Dallas Stars website. Um, let's, and, and there's just tons and tons and tons of other gigs that I do that are like that. Recently I started doing um, the lead-in uh, lead-ins and uh, little spots for Fox Sports Southwest. So if you watch, I, probably not over in this region all the time, but if you watch Fox Sports Southwest, you're going to hear my voice there as well. As far as jobs that I regret, I don't regret anything because everything has paid me money and that's my job. And so at the end of the day, whether it is a completely ridiculous, stupid job, which I'll get to in a second, uh, <laughs> or something that gives you the crazy respect that anime does, or something that gives you a different type of respect, like, like Dave and Busters. Like, just for, for everyone in this room, I said, like, oh, I'm American, Canada, and Trunks, and Sanji, and all that stuff at the beginning, and it's like, okay, yeah. But I say I'm the voice of Dave and Busters, and the whole room's like, oh, yeah! Because who doesn't like food, drinks, and video games? Right? I mean, come on. Um, that being said, I do jobs. Uh, I will not tell you, I will not give you all the information on the thing I'm about to talk about. Because it's not my job to do that. It's, if you care enough, you can 
figure it out at some point. But yeah, sometimes you sometimes you do jobs that are questionable. There was an anime a few years ago that I did. I took a, I took a different stage name for because I was told that it had questionable material. Now in my viewpoint, once I saw the anime, I'm like, it's not that questionable. I get where they're coming from, but so I took it. I took a different stage name for that. I do read a lot of uh, books, uh, books on uh, like for aud Audible and stuff. Um, recently, I read one called <laughs> "It's Called the Holocaust." It was all about the Holocaust, the history of the Holocaust. I read. It. I was in the studio for that book every single day for about three weeks, and so you know, every day I, I got to live through these words and perform, so to speak, what it was like to be in the Holocaust. So for three weeks I was not a very happy person. Uh, but then there are... There's like country music coming from over here. <laughs> right? Yeah. We'll figure it out in a second. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> other so, but other jobs that I do as far as voiceover goes, and don't ask because I'm not going to answer the question, but I have voiced some romance books. No, not all romance books. Like dirty, filthy romance books. Because I have a son in graduate school, and he needs... I gotta pay for that somehow, right? So Sometimes you just gotta talk sexy to make that happen. Uh, anyway... And I wouldn't say that I'm not proud of that work, because the fact that I have read those books, got through them without laughing, is a miracle. Uh, but it's, I'm happy to have jobs. I'm happy to have regular jobs. It's interesting. Like, when you're an actor and you're working regularly, it, it, that's actually pretty unique. That doesn't happen in the world of acting all that often. So the fact that I'm doing it, yeah, yeah I mean, at the end of the day, my wife and I are just cracking up, you know? This is what my wife said. Uh, and this is true for all actors, and everyone will back me up on this. My wife, I, when I ask my job, my wife, can I do something for a job? Say I have to perform in a kissing scene or a sex scene or something like that. What do, what do I do? Do I do it? Yeah, I do it. I'm an actor. It's my job. And my wife always says to me, sweetheart, you're a whore, not a slut. <laughs> You don't do this stuff for free. So, as long as my wife's happy, I'm happy. Uh, all right, who else has another question? So, um, Bruce Hassan is actually one of the very first zombies that he got out into and that got me into the anime and the world. And I know it ended up dropping after the first season, but I'm just curious what you thought of the manga as a person? I did not read the manga. I have not read the manga of any any anime that I've voiced in. Uh, it oftentimes, as an actor, would just add to the confusion because sometimes there's differences. Sometimes the anime, the, the manga is harder to understand than the anime. The anime is a little bit more for uh, mass consumption, you know, whereas manga is a little bit more specialized. Uh, but no, I don't do that. I don't read manga. I don't watch anime. Uh, and you know, a lot of people are like, how could you not watch anime? It's real easy. Just don't turn it on. Uh, but the reason is, is because it's it's not it's not out of any kind of disrespect for, for the genre. It's it's that um, you don't. Well, I just equate it back to my life before you. You don't make pizza. I used to work at a pizza joint. When I got cast as Trunks, I was working at a pizza joint. So you don't work at a pizza joint for 40 hours a week, and then on Friday night say, hey, everybody, let's go out for pizza. <laughs> you don't do that. You go any place else. So at the end of every day, I mean, I'm, you know, I could be, uh, God, my agent called me yesterday, and she's like, we need another full day of you at Funimation. Oh my gosh, Okay. So I've got at least two full days out there next week, two full days out there the following week, and that's and that's just the Funimation studio for anime. I work, I do anime at another studio in Dallas, Anime Midstream, and, um, and then I've got to go into that studio for like three, four hour chunks at a time, 
yeah, at the end of all that, I don't want to go home and watch anime. I want to go home and watch, like, Rogue One or something, you know? That's, that's, that's more my speed. All right, who else? Yeah. What was your favorite um, part about Wings of the Italian? Uh, my favorite part of... Did I turn that off? <laughs> I did. My favorite part about voicing Italia is that voicing that character has given me the ability to behave in public around you people the way that is generally considered unacceptable. <laughs> See, now if I show up and I'm around people who know, and I'm like, I'm like, hey, I'm just uh, an annoying punk, and I'm gonna say all this annoying crap to you and talk about cheeseburgers and stuff, losers. <laughs> Everybody's gonna go, ha, America! <laughs> Nobody looks at me and goes, jerk. <laughs> so if I do that at home at the grocery store, I'm just a jerk. <laughs> so that's been the best part about it. By the way, country music stuff, I think it's somebody in the next room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, who else? Yes. What was your favorite voice? My favorite voice? Yeah. Of any person ever on the history of the world? <laughs> My favorite voice that I do, it's hard to judge. I know which ones I like playing the best, which would probably be Desert Punk in America. Because that's where I get to be the idiot <laughs> that I truly am inside. So probably those guys. All right, who else? Yes? What was it like for recording Tales? How do you say it? Exilia? Yeah. Zilia? Who knows that video game? Some of you? So I played the bad guy on that? It sucked. <laughs> that was awful, recording that game. And not due to anyone I was uh, partnered with. The studio was great director, engineer, they were all wonderful people. I believe a place called Teacup Studios out in Los Angeles. They were great. Problem was that I recorded it after Anime Expo. I had gone out to Los Angeles for Anime Expo. I was there like a day before Expo started, worked the Expo all weekend long, and then I had one day of recovery before I went into the booth to record that game. And the day after Anime Expo, I had no voice. I literally could not form words through my mouth. So it was a challenge getting my voice to even work on the day that I recorded that game. But I, it seemed like it came together. And maybe all the stress that I was under at the time made the performance a little bit more unhinged. So. Thank God it was a bad guy. If it was a good guy, it would have sucked. Well, more so than normal. Um, all right, who else? Yeah. Uh, when you were voicing Trunks, what was it like doing all these screaming Super Saiyan scenes? Were you able to talk back to that? Oh, yeah, man. Once you get used to this, the screaming, uh, getting used to screaming is like getting used to singing. Once you know how to do it, it's second nature. I can scream all, all the time, all day, for the most part, and it's it's not a big deal because I understood breath control, how to uh, how to control the breath coming through the vocal cords so that you're using less breath and getting more sound, and that doesn't fry your voice out. So it ended up not being a big deal at first. Yeah, first few sessions I fried my voice, but you know. It's like, I was cast as Trunks on Dragon Ball Z, and then I come home and I'm like, Ugh, oh, my voice hurts so bad from being a super popular actor all day. <laughs> it was hardly something to complain about, you know. So. Uh, Alright, who else? <clears throat> Good, we've got some more. Yes, ma'am. Um, besides being able to look at the anime on screen, is there a specific difference between voice acting for video games and voice acting for anime? There is a tremendous difference, yeah. The difference between voice acting for anime and voice acting for a video game is volume. That's really the best way to put it. In an anime, um, you record by yourself, alone, in a booth, usually one line at a time. If, you, if you're good at it, you've worked at it for a while, you can record maybe a whole scene or a whole page at a time, stuff like that. 
And I've been doing this for 17 years, so I can record an entire page or more of dialogue. But see, what happens is when I record those lines, then the engineer and director have to review it, look at it, fit it, tighten it up, do all their technical stuff, which leaves me for a, leaves me having some downtime in the booth, right? So sometimes uh, while they do that, I will check an email or really I'll pay a bill or <laughs> you know read a book. I'm reading The Stand right now for the first time. So it's kind of going everywhere with me because it's so darn long. Uh, but uh, so there, so there's that. But the biggest difference is the fact that in in anime you're recording like that, and with video games you just get you just get a script in a in an Excel document that's just got a bank of lines. Boom, 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 all the way down the page. Sometimes a thousand. Okay, so I played the tournament announcer in Dragon Ball Z as well, right? Which means that I got to do that character on all the video games, which is incredibly difficult. And it's also weird the way you record video games because if you're recording a, uh, you're recording video game voiceover for an algorithm, uh, your voice has to fit in to a computer program, right? In anime, you're recording right to animation that exists. So there's actually a lot of these little uh, differences, but on a video game, for example, you got to do it like this. You record a piece at a time, and you run down the whole list as far as you can go for as long as you can, getting either one, two, or three takes per line, depending on what your director wants. Now, because I've been doing Dragon Ball Z stuff for a while, I usually only have to get one take on those things. So it'll sound something like this. Goku versus Goku. Vegeta versus Vegeta. Okay, so what you do is you have the Goku versus take, and then Goku for him to fight either himself or you can mix and match it because I'm saying Goku versus Vegeta versus Trunks versus, and over here it's Goku, Trunks, Vegeta, right? And you can mix and match those. Now it can be Goku versus Trunks or Vegeta versus Vegeta, you know, however the algorithm or however you decide to play the game. So that's, you record it like one big bank of crap you don't understand in a video game. It's really what you're doing. Okay, who's next? I saw some over here, yes. Um, have you started recording for Dragon Ball Super yet? No. I really wish I could answer that question better than that. That's oh, crap. Okay. I know, I know. That's, no, <laughs> I haven't. There, I take all the wind out of your sails. I'm sorry. All right, hold on. You, there's another guy back here. You had a question? Yeah. Do you enjoy acting or the production side more? Uh, 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 I, uh, that's difficult. It depends on the thing. For the most part, I prefer writing. And I'm not talking about anime. I'm talking about me writing. because And I've written things, like maybe you guys don't know, I've written movies and TV series and shit like that. But I don't... I prefer writing things that I come up with because that's where I have total creative control. As an actor, you don't really have much creative control as an actor. It's just kind of your job to do what the director needs you to do, specifically. Uh, as a writer, if I'm sitting at home, I'm, it's like I'm writing a new thing right now. And I'm just having so much fun with it. It's a pain because like, I'm making all these decisions. I'm like, well, the story needs to be like this. Oh, but what about this? This would be cool. Oh, and this would be cool too. No, Eric, the movie can't be four hours long. So that's, that's fun. I do tend to enjoy that creative process a little bit more than acting. Uh, but acting will always be my number one love and passion, always. All right, cool. So, oh, yeah, you had a question. I did, I did. I was voice director for Borderlands 2, and of course I was the ADR director for a lot of anime. Uh, it's kind of, it kind of goes back to what I was saying. You know, it's like directing... There's more required of the director in a video game than in an anime. The reason being, in an anime, you have an entire scene. You can look at the whole scene. The actor can watch the whole scene. 
And as a director, it is your job to communicate what's happening in the scene, uh, you know, the proximity of this character to those characters around him or her. In a video game, it's a lot less like that. In a video game, uh, a lot of the things that you record, especially in like Borderlands 2, you had two kinds of characters, really. You had the fighting characters and then the NPCs, right? Non-playable characters. And those NPCs are hysterical. Most of it is just, you have dialogue and it's just, you just got to get an actor in the booth to do that, uh, to do their thing, you know? So my buddy Jeremy Inman, who played Android 16 in DVC, and he's an ADR director, I directed him as an NPC in Borderlands 2, and he was uh, he was a drunk guy. And I'm like, just be drunk. You know how to do that well. I said, sure. Look. And so there's a lot of that going on, you know. And he's and he's like, I, I don't know what else to do to talk about it. I'm, huh? You know, and things like that. Those were takes. And I'd say, keep it. And we'd throw it into the program somehow. And I'd tell the Gear, uh, gearbox people just make that work, and they did. And when you hear him walking around the city, it's hysterical. Um, but then you know, then you have the the playable characters or the bad guys, and all they are is just grunts and excerpts and fighting and shooting and whipping and all these activities, right? Which is very challenging for the actor. But as a director, there's just not much for you to do. So you there's. There are things that make directing a video game more fun than anime, but then there's things like story uh, in a in a line to line basis in an anime, which makes that more fun to direct. So they each have their benefits. Yeah. All right, well, yes. I've played with people you like voice and stuff. Do you prefer to do it with the Could you relate to any of the backstories or anything? Could I relate to any of the backstories of the characters I play? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, and that's where the acting comes in. That's where the training comes in. I, I really can't. I mean, you know, Kimberly's a genocidal maniac, and I've never even killed one person. <laughs> um, Yugi? No. I have no basis of reference for that guy. Um, Trunks? Everybody on Earth was killed. You're all here. I mean, I, you know, so, not in anime. In anime, that's the thing. It's that anime is just a form of superhero show. It's, it's dynamic characters and dynamic stories. I mean, I know that there are some, like, free that are a little bit more based in reality and whatnot, but um, that's not what I get cast in, you know? I get cast in bigger, bolder type characters. Which is great, they're fun to play, but I, I don't have much of a frame of reference. Like, I mean, like, look at Sanji. You know, I'm not a pirate. I'm not crazy about being out on the water, but I do love to cook. So he and I have that in common. But he cooks things that, you know, aren't real. So it makes it difficult when you try to do that at home. Uh, all right, who else? Yes. I have, I have always wanted to be an actor. Um, I came from a, uh, a Texas football family, and my dad thought I would be a sports star, so that's all I did for the first 10 years of my life, and then when I was 10, I sat down and I said I never, ever want to play sports again. I hate it, and please don't make me. And he was like, oh, okay, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be an actor. And he was like, huh? huh? And uh, for a few years, he just didn't know what to make of me until he saw me in my first play, and then he was like, oh yeah, you're way better at this than sports, so <laughs> you, should, you should keep doing this. Um, so, who else? Yes? Uh, I do not play an instrument, but I did play the trombone in middle school. I was always last chair, and I wasn't, I just wasn't very good at it. I'm not very musically inclined. You know, I can carry a tune if I need to. You know, if, if I'm in a musical, I can sing and dance if I need to. But I'm just not, I'm not musically inclined. You know, it'd be nice if I was. I'd love to be able to 
play the guitar and play a piano, but I don't. I, I never much had the patience to learn. You know. So. All right. Well, I want somebody new. Yes, you're in the back. Uh, it's, it's a bit hard for uh, people just starting in the industry. Or, uh, what steps did you take to get started, basically? Well, um, what steps did I do to get started in this industry? That's the that's the big question. Uh, I didn't I didn't set out to do this. I didn't set out to be a voice actor. I didn't set out to book this kind of role or these kinds of roles to end up here in front of you guys. All I wanted to do, and like you just heard me say, from the time I was ten. All I wanted to do was be an actor. I just wanted to act. I just wanted to perform. And so I did. You know? Uh, damn near everybody in my life growing up told me that I would not succeed. Um, that's the reason most people don't pursue artistic endeavors. Because the people around them think that it's a pie-in-the-sky dream. Except for the fact that Art is everywhere around you constantly. And it is every single artistic endeavor is a viable lifestyle for somebody. Or we wouldn't have, God, I mean, you're not seeing what I'm seeing, but we wouldn't have everything I'm looking at. You know, none of your clothes or sunglasses or shoes were designed by somebody who wasn't artistic. You know, these are all artistic people who did this. So when I was a kid, I, I was like, I can be an actor. I'm going to be an actor. And everyone said no. And all I wanted to do was act. All I, I, so I dedicated myself to it from the age of 10. And I read books. And I took classes both in school and out of school. I researched on a near constant basis I was a theater major once I got to college and, uh, and kept pursuing it, kept taking classes in school and out of school. And I would do plays at my school and at other universities or other theaters, both professional and community. Um, I chased it as hard and as fast as I could until uh, there was some success which only led to me chasing it more. So, it's, it's, it's hard to do this for a living, but I've never wanted to do anything else. And that's the kind of dedication that it takes in order to do this. Unless you can't think of doing another thing with your life other than being an actor, well then you can be an actor. You know, There's so many people out there you know, like my son. My son is also an actor. Okay? Uh, he's in grad school right now getting his teaching certificate. And that's to supplement his acting until it can take off, which is a smart way to go about it. But I told him for years, since he was a kid, I was like, please be anything other than an actor. It is an incredibly difficult road. It's a hard journey. And it's such a challenge, especially when it comes to family, because you're not the only person who makes sacrifices. Your family does, too. Um, he's so smart. He's My son read the book Dune in a day. That's like a thousand pages. And he'll just zip, 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 retain the whole thing. He's highly intelligent, and yet he wanted to be an actor. And the reason he wanted to be an actor is because, like me, he can't see himself doing anything. It's a hard thing, man. Is that what you want to do? Uh, something along the lines, basically. Uh, I was thinking maybe that uh, um, Well, I'm sorry. Now I've got to do this. Okay, I can see you now. Um, how old are you? Uh, 19. You're 19? Yes, sir. You, uh, are you in college? Uh, just started. Just started? Yes, sir. Just walk over to their theater department. So it's like this, man. If uh, Get on a stage. You can, anywhere. You're going to have a community theater nearby where you can do it, or you've got a, a theater at your school where you can do it. If you get on a stage and you perform and it gets its hooks in you, then chase it. 
but a lot of people I hear, and I'm not hearing this from you, but I hear from a lot of people, uh, I don't really want to be on stage, I just want to be a voice actor. Well, that's kind of a recipe for failure. That's like saying, well, I don't want to learn how to cook, I just want to learn how to make spaghetti. Like, okay, you might make okay spaghetti, but you're not going to know how to cook anything else. It's just, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So get on the stage. I think you'd be surprised at how much fun it is. You know, and hey, it might change the course of your life. Yes, sir. What is up with that? Everyone keeps calling me sir. Not here. No, I live, guys, I live in Dallas. I am the South. You know? But it's at, it's at home. Both my daughter and my son, like over the past six months, have started calling me sir. And I'm like, I'm not, what is going on? And I go out there and everyone's like, yes, sir. But I'm like, you know what I think it is, is that I finally, finally the gray is taking over my whole head. It's up in my hair, all over my beard. And now I look like a sir. <laughs> sucks. What? Dude? Yeah, dude's fine. I can dig dude. I don't dig dudes. But I can dig dude. Alright, who else has a question? Yes. You weren't even looking at me. <laughs> she just goes. <laughs> Oh, uh, there's quite a few. I can't say that there's one. Uh, there's there's a lot of things that stand out. None of the things that stand out to me in my career as an actor are the things that would that that would mean anything to most other people. You know, they're they're like things like my okay to the opposite of what I was just saying. Uh, my son wanting to follow in my footsteps because he's seen what I've been able to accomplish. That's awesome. Okay, so stuff like that. Stuff like this is great. A whole bunch of people coming to sit in a room to listen to my stupid punk ass say things. <laughs> Guys, I'm just an idiot. Just regular old idiot, you know? Things like that are super cool. Um, you know, there, there's... So, there's so many things that are fun and, and easy to love about what I do. I have people who come out here, like I say, sit here and listen to me. People who like me, people who tell me how much they love what I do, which means so much to me. But on the opposite end of that, I get a whole bunch of people who tell me that I should be fired from my job. I should also kill myself, and that I'm a terrible father, and that my children should die. So really, it is, it's a unique little world to live in. I know everyone's really shocked because, you know, the internet's usually such a safe place. <laughs> but that's that's the extremes, you know? I, I have to sit back and wrap my head around the fact that people are telling me to kill myself because they didn't like the character I played or they don't like my voice, you know? So that's a lot of fun. <laughs> But uh, it must mean that I'm affecting people to some degree, or they wouldn't have such a passionate response, right? So I'm not gonna. So I choose to look at it in a positive light. <laughs> Pollyanna, this crap. Um, oh, thanks. My wife is not that happy about that aspect of my personality. Every day, she's like. Why do you have to Pollyanna everything? <laughs> not Pollyanna, I'm just, I prefer to think positively instead of negatively. You know, sometimes I'm negative. But sometimes anyway. Alright, hold on. Is there anything a character has said that stuck with you? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, the reason characters, the, and here's why. Uh, the things. And when you say the things the characters say, you mean the things that I'm saying as a character? Yeah. All right. I didn't know if you meant like uh, things I heard from other characters. Okay. The reason it doesn't, re I don't retain that information is because oftentimes when I'm in a booth recording a character, I will say a line one time and I'll never hear it again. So I record, move on, record, move on, and the way that uh, the way that as an audience member, you or me, in the things that I watch, 
the way that things really land with you is usually on repeat viewings. So, you know, you can watch something once, and it can mean something to you, but it's the second time or the third time that you've watched a certain anime or an episode or show or movie where it really starts to take on that kind of significance, where you start memorizing the lines, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's really hard to do that when you're only saying it once and moving on. All right, who else? Yeah. Um, the TV series on Ruby, Sorry, Yep, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Yeah. Okay, so in the summer of 1994, 94, oh, 84. <laughs> the summer of 84. Uh, actually, 1984 is just a stellar year for movies. If you guys didn't know it, right? 1984, you had uh, Beverly Hills Cop, Ghostbusters, The Karate Kid, Footloose, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and, it, and Real Genius, and it just it goes on and on. It's an amazing list of films came out that year. Well, I lived in Beaumont, Texas, where there is, there's less to do in Beaumont, Texas than there is to do behind this screen. So, if you're stuck in that boring place, for years, you go to the movies. Especially because it's Beaumont, Texas. It's further south than Houston. It's kind of on the coast, but not really. It's just enough inland for it to be ridiculously humid year-round and blisteringly hot in the summer. So, where do you go? You go where it's cold, inside the movie theater. So I went to the movie theater. Breaking to Electric Boogaloo. Breaking to Electric Boogaloo also. 1984. Uh, so, I would just go to the movies. I saw Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom eight times that summer. That's just one movie. And um, I remember when I was watching it, like, I always loved Indiana Jones, loved Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I'm watching this second film, thinking how awesome it is, and thinking, man, I want to be an archaeologist. Like, even in mind, when I'm watching this, I'm 10. Right? So I'm thinking, that's what archaeologists do. <laughs> And I'm not, I'm not 10 years old now. Is there a 10-year-old in the room? Who's the youngest person here? How old are you? Yeah. You're 19. How old are you? Yeah. Okay. How old are you with the orange hoodie? 15? And the next year? 15. Okay, let's say the 15 years old. They're the youngest ones. Right? You're 12? Yeah. All right, you're the youngest person in the room. Next time I ask that question, you should raise your hand first. Uh, <laughs> you knew you were the youngest person here. Um, so, you're 12 years old. 12 years old today is vastly different than 12 years old when I was 12. Because you have things like the internet and cell phones. And, well, that's enough. <laughs> um... I didn't have those things when I was 10 years old, so to me, movies and TV and the things that I was watching, they, they carried a little bit more uh, a weight of reality, you know? So I go and watch Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom at 10, not knowing much about archaeology, thinking this is what archaeologists do. I hate Nazis. I want to fight them, right? Uh, but it turns out that's not it. And that summer, I went I, to the library and I read about archaeology and what it would take to become one. And I'm like, oh, they spend a lot of time in the library. And it looks pretty boring. <laughs> and not one of them carries a whip. So, oh, how do we get around this? I'm like, oh, why well, just do what they're doing? They made a movie. That's not real. I can make movies. I can be an actor. And I looked into it. I'm like, that sounds awesome. And then... <laughs> I started doing it, and it felt incredible, and it, I have continued chasing that feeling until today. So yeah, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom really just single-handedly changed my life. So, so good. Who has not seen Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom? <laughs> like two people, three, four, y'all are all losers. All of you should just leave now and go watch that movie. So good, you won't be disappointed. Uh, what? <clears throat> Look, trust me, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is better than all of my panels combined. Okay, it's Indiana Jones. Alright, who else? 
Come on, we can't be done. You've asked a lot. I want, okay. Okay, so you first, and then I'll come back to you. Okay, yes, in that. So, is it the same way with video games with you? Like, is it a syndrome? No. A what? Well, you play video games, and now they're in Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, same thing with anime. Um, video games are easier because I'm not voicing video games for 20 to 40 hours a week. You know? Um, that being said, I can't play the video games that I've worked on. You know, like, I can't play Borderlands 2, mostly because I'm terrible at it. And I try it real hard. I even got Ian Sinclair to co-op with me online to help me beat some levels. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing! And he's like, it's obvious. <laughs> uh, but I do like video games, and I, I, I like a handful of them. I, I, I'm very specific about what I want in a game, and what I want is a ga in a game is, in me, for me, it needs to be plug and play. I need to be able to turn it on, play immediately for a short period of time, and walk away with no repercussions. So, uh, playing RPGs, uh, you know, that's almost impossible for me. So I play things like Hitman and Battlefield, uh, you know, stuff like that, where, where it's just, I can just jump in, run a gun, and go, you know, kill some people, let it, you know, let it off a little bit, and then get back to my regular life. Okay, yes? What was your very first anime convention as a guest? Oh, my very first anime convention as a guest was Anime Expo in Anaheim, California with Chris Sabat, and it was one of the most epic weekends ever. Uh, so there's... <laughs> Uh, I didn't know Chris that well at the time. He and I had both been voicing. He'd been voicing for a while. He hired me as Trunks and directed me and taught me how to do this. So he and I had been working together for, I want to say, six months or so, you know, and uh, almost every day. So we got to be pretty good friends at that point. And uh, Funimation asked us to go to Anime Expo in Anaheim, and it was a smaller convention than it is now, of course, and we, uh, Chris and I went, actually, I flew out there early to visit with a friend of mine, and then the next day, or later that night, or whatever, I had to go pick up Sabbath, I rented a car, and I had to go pick him up at the Burbank airport, for whatever reason, and I drove all the way out to Burbank, and I picked him up. And it's in the evening, and <laughs> and then this happens. We we're driving and we're talking, and he's like, "Hey man, I, I you know I don't know if you dig like live music or stuff. Do you, do you like that?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I don't know. I like live music, sure." And he goes, "Well, there's this band that's playing tonight, and the name of the band is Ween." And I'm like, "He goes, do you know them?" And I'm like, "Ween is my favorite band." <laughs> so yeah, I know Ween. And he goes. They're playing, in, and we don't know, but keep in mind, we don't know anything about Los Angeles at the time. And I'm driving, and he goes, he goes, they're playing in some place called Pomona? And I'm like, Pomona? And I point, and there's the sign that says, Pomona, city limits. And I'm like, exit! And I just take the first exit, I loop around, and pull right into the venue where the band is playing. Just, and I'm like, I look at him, I'm like, did that just happen? We just arbitrarily take an exit and we are at the venue of the band that you just mentioned, who also happens to be my favorite band of all time. And he's like, you know? Ran inside, watched Ween play, and then Wayne got fat burgers and went back to our hotel room. You know, slept in a very gassy room that night. You know? Um... And then the next day, we had our first signing, and uh, I remember the shirt I was wearing, even, and I had a video camera with me, because I was like, I want a video camera, tape everything, see what it's like. And I got, we got to the table, and there's a bunch of crap, it doesn't matter, but we get to the table, and there's like 3,000 people in line, and it goes all the way around the con, out the side, and we're like, wow, what are those people here for? And they're like, the guy's like, they're all here to see you guys. We're like, uh, oh, all right. So we sit down, 
and it's just boom, 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 and just signing. It was just a blistering experience. Just, what is going on? You know? So my first day ever signing autographs out of the gate was at this massive con for over 3,000 people, and I had no, no idea what I was doing, what I was getting into, or anything. But it was exciting. It was really exciting. Wait, hold on. I think time it is. Okay. Oh. Yes? Uh, is there anything that's not yet done that you would like to work on? Any shows? No. No, I don't think of things like that as an actor. Um, and here's why. If, uh, as an actor, I audition every day for something. And at no point do I ever say to myself, ooh, I really want that gig. I mean, sure, there are gigs that I want more than others. Usually, they're the ones that pay the most. But, uh, and it's not that you work harder for one job than another, but, you know, you pay attention to see if you get the big jobs, and you don't worry so much about not getting the small jobs. Uh, but generally speaking, yeah. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, that's something else I did. All the fart sounds uh, at Funimation. I made all the fart noises. I was in this proud moment of my two hours of my life was committed to make fart noises in a booth, and I got paid for it. It was amazing. I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty good at farting with my mouth. Um, I'm sorry, so where, where, what was the question again? Where was I? Uh, the question was, uh, is there anything that is not, like, anything, like, from what I'm saying, that has not yeah. been dubbed that you would like to work on? Right, no. And, and it's just not really, because if, if, I, if I worry about what I'm auditioning for, then I'll worry about everything I'm auditioning for, and it kind of gets into your head as an actor, so you really just audition and move forward. You know? <laughs> audition, move forward, audition, move forward. If you book something, great. But yeah, generally speaking, not really because I don't I don't like to get hung up on on the what ifs, you know. There's there's enough there's enough what nows, you know. So all right, who else? Mm hmm. Yeah, sorry, I got a lot of questions. Um, yes. What was the first gift you ever got from a fan? I don't know. Um, I've gotten a lot of nice gifts over the years from fans. Some of them have been. Interesting. One of the coolest ones I ever got was uh, this young woman made me and the whole cast of Beck uh, plushies of the dog. Oh, I still have it. I still have that at home. And, you know, I've gotten plushies, hand all homemade, handmade stuff. I've gotten also plushies of the alien from uh, Natalia, Tony, and uh, the cloud. I don't know, whatever. But I, you know, I get, trust me, I get a lot of stuff where I'm like, this is great! I don't know what this is. <laughs> you know, but I appreciate it. And I'll, I'll, I, most everything that I get from the fans goes right home to my daughter. You know, because she loves, she loves this stuff. So, I just bring, I bring her the thing. She has a pile of stuffed animals in the corner of her room. And a lot of them are things that I picked up at conventions uh, from fans. I can't recall what the first thing I ever got was, but, um, uh, anyway, that's kind of a smattering of the things I've received over the years. Who else? Who else? Come on, come on. Oh, look, some new people! Okay, in the back, yes. In regards to the last question, can you name the weirdest gift you've ever gotten from a fan? Oh, I can name the weirdest gift <laughs> I've ever gotten. I've gotten cool gifts from fans, too. Like, one time I was... It, actually, the con that's happening right now in Boise, Idaho, uh, Chris Sabat is there this week. And a couple of years ago, I was there with Monica Riala, Todd Haberkorn, Sean Schimmel, and Jamie Markey. And we were all at dinner one night, and a bottle of wine shows up on our table from a fan who just happened to be walking by, seeing us eating, and went and bought us a bottle of wine and sent it to the table. Right? So that's super cool. You know, I love that. Uh, but your question was, what was the weirdest? So, I don't know if it's a gift, but I still have them. Uh, in 2004, 
I was in Australia, and uh, it was in Sydney. I was there with my wife, and this young woman who's about 19 is the first person in the autograph line two days in a row. And two signings, two days, both the first day and the second day, she was the first person in line. And both times, she's holding a letter, and both times, she cries when she hands it to me. Now, when you read the letter, it's not a well individual. It's somebody who has who is kind of gone off the deep end because she was talking about you know the weird things that the people who are unhinged say about that you should be together, which always sounds like a hurt to me. You know, she's like, we should be together, and my husband and mother both told me that you wouldn't be receptive to this, but I said I don't care. No, they were right. I am not receptive to the 19-year-old girl who wants to be with me. You know, mainly because it ew. Uh, you're younger than my kid. Um, and I'm also married. And anyway. So I keep those letters. The letter from first day and the letter from the second day. This is also the woman who chased my wife down across the convention floor and tried to tackle her. And uh, she herself got tackled by a guy my size, which was really fun to watch. <laughs> so that was a weird gift. I don't know if it's a gift, but it's a thing, and I'll call it that. All right, and you had a question. Yeah, do you ever do anything Silly and public with your voice, like we're at fast food is drunk. Uh, uh, no, no, I don't. I don't do that at fast food or any not in trunks voice, and I don't use any character voices to do things like that. But what I do, and I recommend it to anybody in this room who is planning on becoming an actor. How many of you get sales calls on your phone all the time, right? Constantly. Half the time, it's just that recorded message from Rachel at Cardholder Services. Right? The other half of the time, it's actual people. Okay, oftentimes, they're people from an Indian call center, right? But sometimes they're just, you know, people from here. And it doesn't matter. Indian call center or American call center, treat them the same. Every single time you answer and there's a person there, it's an acting exercise for me. So... I immediately take a character's position, like, uh, I'll just who, off the top of my head, invent a character, run with it. And I try to keep the person on the phone as long as humanly possible. <laughs> uh, it's a blast. Uh, I, 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 uh, I got into a fierce argument with a guy yesterday uh, because I, uh, he, he, so I have a business called Five Tenet Productions. That's it's just an incorporation where I can funnel my money. It's it's basically I need a business entity so that the business entity makes the money, and then I can cut myself paychecks from the business entity and take out a, the proper taxes to go to the government. Right? Standard business. But this business Five Tenet, it's, it's my phone numbers out there as a, as I'm like a storefront. So I get these storefront business calls all the time. And this guy's like, yeah, I was just calling to see uh, if I could talk to uh, you know the owner of uh, Five Tonnet. And I'm like, uh, okay. And he's like, yeah, I was just wondering uh, you know, who handles all your, uh, your insurance uh, at your company there. And I'm like, yeah, you, you, got, you got the wrong kind of number. And he's like, well, I mean, did you say you could handle this or not? I'm like, uh, you, this isn't a business. And he's like, well, I mean, either you're the person at the business who can answer these questions or you're not. I mean, are you telling me that you don't own your own business? And now I'm just, listen, him or ever! Why don't you do this to that person and then wrap that thing up and stick it in the so-and-so? And I mean, I just ripped into this guy. And uh, that didn't end well. Uh, but uh, my favorite one happened last week. Hold on. I don't think I can play this for you guys. I don't think. Uh, we've got a 12 year old in the room. <laughs> Not you! That's the beardiest 12 year old I've ever seen. 
you know, uh, I do have a recording of one time when this happened when I was in a booth. I took my phone into the booth with me. For some reason, it was an emergency situation, like I was waiting on a call from my wife or something. The phone rang, and it was a number I didn't recognize, and I told the engineer, roll the tape, and I answered it on speakerphone. And, um, and this guy, he's, he's from the Indian call center, and he says that his name is Damien, and I called him the son of the devil. I go, Damien? You mean like the, the son of the devil? And he lost control. Like, I mean, like a litany of cuss words that I hadn't ever considered putting together. <laughs> it was hysterical. But, like, three days ago, I've had a real, just so you guys know, I've had a really, 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 really bad week. Uh, I, uh, um, my, uh, uh, there's something I won't say it on camera. There's some things happening with my family at home, uh, namely with my uh, ten-year-old daughter, who I know. And something happened this week with her that uh, changed things. <laughs> right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, my whole house is like, oh no! <laughs> So, for those who don't understand, the ones who do explain it to them. Uh, so that has been going on. My dog, so last uh, December I had ACL surgery. I ripped my ACL off my bone, and uh, that was awesome. Uh, my dog apparently did the same thing a couple weeks ago. So she's not even using her back leg. We take her into the doctor. She gets all this medicine. And then yesterday, she eats all of it. Oh. So she is currently, right now, at the doctor, throwing everything up still, and getting fluids, and is going to have to spend the night in the hospital. Now, this is maybe half of the crap that's happened in my house this week that's nightmarish. Uh, there are some other things that are horrific that I won't go into. But um, when in the middle of all this, I was frustrated, and somebody called me and telemarketer guy calls me again from India and I'm like hey how's it going he's like I'm just wondering if I could sell you this brace I, I you, you have pain and it's kind of broken English he's like you have pain so I'm going to give you this brace and I'm like are you trying to sell me a brace for my body and he goes yes for your pain you just need to tell me what your pain is and I go well my pain is in my head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Knees and toes. <laughs> and he goes, it's where? It's in my head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Knees and toes. <laughs> and he starts writing it down. It's in your head and your shoulders and your knees. Knees and toes. Knees and toes. And uh, then he starts asking me about my doctor. But who's your doctor who's diagnosing your pain in your head, shoulders, knees, and toes? Knees and toes. But who's your doctor? Uh, I've been seeing Dr. Seuss. <laughs> he's colorful, and I like his candy, but I don't really understand what he's talking about or what I'm diagnosed with. And he's like, do you... Can we? Can you give me your doctor's information? <laughs> so I started saying, like, well, I know he doesn't like green eggs and ham. <laughs> Sam, I am. And this went on for 20 minutes. <laughs> I, I answered the phone when I left my house, and I hung up when I pulled into Chris Sabat's studio. So... Um, I recommend everybody do that if you have the opportunity and make make those people's lives as difficult as they've been making ours. Uh, okay, so that's my time for right now, guys. I'll be here all weekend. <laughs>